But we are continuing through Acts as we talk about each Sunday. I just say that, especially those who may be joining us today, who we have not seen uh, this summer or haven't seen before, perhaps visiting the first time, we have been methodically reading through the book of Acts as journey of faith. Paul said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then Paul said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Paul entered the synagogue or the meeting place and for three months spoke out boldly and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. When some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way, again, what they called the early church, before the congregation, he left them, taking the disciples with him and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. So now may God and a blessing to the reading of God's word. In fact, I'm glad Dolly is here because I'm going to talk about baseball. And she is one of the baseball fans here. I, I know I talk a lot about sports, but just hang with me for a moment uh, in what I want to begin with today. But I want to start by there's an adage, there's a, a saying that we have that perhaps you've heard or even perhaps you have yourself said that I want to challenge this morning. It's a saying that goes like this, practice makes perfect, right? Practice makes perfect. And let me just say, no, it doesn't. Uh, because there's no such thing as perfect. And I can remember what I wanted to talk about to begin with this morning. I remember the day, it was back eight years ago now. See, nobody's perfect, but everybody's loved. I remember back on June 2nd, 2010, there was a Tigers game on, and I happened to have it on in our basement, our man cave family room back in Detroit, and I was watching this game, and pitching that night for the Detroit Tigers was this gentleman right here named Armando Galarraga. Now, Armando Galarraga went on to play six seasons of Major League Baseball, and I would say to you today that he was not even average. Now, he had to be good because he pitched in the Major Leagues. But I think his career, he won 26 games and lost 34. But on this night, June 2nd, 2010, Armando Galarraga had a perfect game going as the game was going on. Now, anybody, again, knows baseball. When you are watching a perfect game or no hitter, you are not allowed to say the words, perfect game or no hitter because if you say it you jinx it and so I was watching the game the announcers kind of kept saying well nobody's been on base so far meaning nobody has gotten on base so far they have not been able to get on base and they just kind of the announcer let you know and so I even started to call friends of mine and say hey you need to turn on the game why because you got to turn on the game why trust me just turn on the game and so I had many friends around Detroit watching the game. I even called Michelle, who in some ways could care less. And, babe, you got to come watch the game. Why? You just got to come watch the game. Because I couldn't say what it was. And as the game went on and on, he was getting closer and closer. Now, just know this. There have been, in the history of Major League Baseball, over 140 years of baseball, 220,000 games played. There have been 23 perfect games. 
23. That's how rare this is. In fact, the last time I remember being engaged in one was back in 1981 when Len Barker pitched a perfect game for the Cleveland Indians, living in Cleveland. So 81, now 2001, I've waited 20 years. And here the moment is again. I was 11 then, now I was older. <laughs> I don't have time to do the math. And I'm watching it and watching it. And he got, you have to get 27 outs, right? No one's been hit by a ball. No one's gotten a walk. No one has gotten a first base. This guy has to get 27 outs. He had 26 outs. Ninth inning, two outs. I, was I couldn't believe I was going to see it. Armando Galarraga was going to pitch a perfect game. And that night, a fit, the umpire at first base was a man named Jim Joyce, longtime umpire professional, who was right there at first base. So the Cleveland Indian, his name I think was Donald, got up, hit the ball. The first baseman, Miguel Cabrera, ran over, grabbed the ball, turned, flipped it to Armando Galarraga, and I'll let you look for yourself. Galarraga, see the ball in his mitt? Galarraga caught the ball. And the runner was not yet there. I jumped up. I saw a perfect game. And the umpire said, safe. That's what I said. <laughs> and a few other choice words. I was stunned. I could, it was so obvious that he was out. And the umpire, looking at the play, said, safe. And this is before replay. Don't you wish you could have replay in life as well? <laughs> Let me go back and look at the film. <laughs> I wouldn't do that again, nope. But there was no replay, and there's nothing they could do about it. And all of a sudden, Galarraga went from having a perfect game to having a one-hitter, and he got the next batter out. He's the only pitcher ever pitched a perfect game to 28 batters. So after the game, and oh, I was so mad, Michelle, I was calling Major League Baseball that night. I was calling, we need to go protest, we need to shut this thing down. I was so mad. <laughs> Because it's so unjust, he got robbed right before our eyes. And then I'll never forget, after the game, they were interviewing, first of all, the umpire, Jim Joyce, who got a chance to watch the play later and said, I cannot believe I messed that up. And Jim Joyce was so, he said, I'm so sorry. I blew that call. I, I don't know what happened to me. And then he went to Mondo Galarraga. And I'll never forget this. This is why I love sports in some way, because all of a sudden, this baseball game took on a theological dimension. Because when they asked Armando Galarraga, who again would go on to have a very mediocre career, but for this one moment, they asked him how he felt about the umpire robbing him of this game. And his words were, nobody's perfect. And the reporter said, but you were perfect. And he said, no, nobody's perfect. Wow. Nobody perfect. And that's something I think, again, that we in church also need to claim and own and, and talk about. How nobody's what? Perfect. And even then, as a church, as we grow together, as Journey of Faith, I've often spoken to about, we are not here to strive to be perfect. Because if you're looking for a church that is perfect in all they say and all they do and all they are, and if they tell you they're perfect, they are a perfect cult and not a church. Because church is a place we don't strive to be perfect, but we do strive to be healthy. To be a healthy place. Interesting thing that happens in this moment as he comes into Ephesus to, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to show this. The next day, Armando Galarraga came out of the dugout to hand a lineup card to Jim Joyce and put his hand on his back to tell him, it's okay, nobody's perfect. But also then Paul goes to this place in Ephesus 
And as he's passing through, we're told as he's going to Ephesus to start a new church, he finds out that there's already a church there. He goes to Ephesus and he finds out that there is already a group of disciples who gather together. There's already a church that's present. And not only is this just a church or disciples, look how many there are. Twelve. Sound familiar? I mean, it sounds like they got it all together. As he gets there and finds that there's already disciples present. But what happens next has always had me, again, intrigued and curious about what was it that made Paul ask this question? Because when Paul gets there, he asked them a question. You see in verse 2, he wants to know, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? You got to wonder, what in the heck were they doing that made Paul wonder, wait a minute, do you have the Holy Spirit? See, one thing you always got to keep in mind is that not every spirit in church is holy. And before you look around for that unholy spirit, <laughs> know that we're talking about you too. <laughs> you know, not every church is church. Not every church has a holy spirit. I can recall a, a colleague of mine who we knew had a lot of issues and had some struggle of his own with addictions. And it came time to elect a new bishop back in Michigan. And he was very well known and very popular. And some didn't know what he was dealing with as we knew. And his name was first on the ballot after the first ballot. And he had went off somewhere to pray by himself for a while. And then he came back to the colleagues, his friends, those who knew him well. And he said, well, the spirit told me to let my name go forward. And one of my colleagues said, which spirit told you that? Because again, there are different spirits. Intriguing enough, as I was getting ready for this sermon, in the book of Acts is written by the same person who wrote the book of Luke. And if you look at the book of Luke, in the fourth chapter, the very first miracle that Jesus performs is in the church, is in the synagogue. And it's there in the synagogue, he has an encounter with an unclean spirit or unclean demon. So it's not outside the church, but it's actually in the church where Jesus finds this unclean spirit. And what I'm always amazed about, again, is Jesus cast the spirit out, look down at the bottom what's underlined, the people are only amazed about his power to cast out. Nobody was surprised that there was an unclean spirit in the church. No one was amazed, wow, there was a spirit here. In fact, I know there's a story told about this one gentleman. Well, it was a small town, small town congregation. The church had gathered for worship, and all of a sudden, boom, the prince of darkness showed up. Satan came right in the sanctuary, boom, and there was fire and smoke and sulfur smell, and the whole congregation took off running. Everybody ran out the doors, except for one gentleman. One older gentleman who was married to the church council president, who she'd been president of that church forever, and he just sat right in the congregation. And Satan said, walked over to him and, and said, aren't you scared? He said, no. He said, do you know who I am? He said, yeah, you're Satan. And Satan said, why aren't you scared of me? The old man said, I've been married to your sister for 48 years. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the reality is that this is not a safe place for where unclean spirits or evil can reach. In fact, Martin Luther once said, the devil sets up the devil's tent right in the sanctuary, not the bar. Doesn't have to worry about the bar. But it's right here where it dwells. And, and I also, again, I'm very clear, I don't preach about them. You know, it's not about them, it's about us. Jesus said, look at your heart. That's why Jesus said, don't 
talk about the speck in your neighbor's eye and you have a redwood coming out of yours. It's about constant prayer and looking for the Holy Spirit because just because you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit one day doesn't mean you're still following the Holy Spirit the next day. And that's why Paul's saying, what spirit do you have here? Because it doesn't seem holy to me. And they said, well, they talked about who they were baptized. He wanted to know whose name were you baptized in. And this is an interesting part, too. They tell him that we were baptized by John. Well, they say, wait, they say, no, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit before. In fact, I often call them the first Lutherans, (laughs) right? Because afraid of the Holy Spirit. So they find out, no, we even have heard of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to know, where, who have you been baptized? What name are you baptized in? Where did it go? Hey, what's happened here? I've lost that slide. Sorry about that. So he asked them whose name you're baptized in, and they actually tell him we were baptized in the name of John. And the John, they speak of it, John the Baptist, the one who was the messenger for the message, the one who proclaimed the way for the one who was the way. And they're saying we were baptized in John the Baptist's baptism, which Paul goes on to say, and this I think is important for us today to hear, Paul says John baptized you with the baptism of repentance. And everybody just say repentance for me, please. Repentance. The baptism of repentance. You know the thing about the word repent? To repent means to turn back. To repent is to turn back. And the idea, of course, is turn back to God. They said we were baptized in John's baptism. We received repentance. We were forgiven of our sins. We turned back to God. In fact, sometimes people say when someone turns their life around that someone just did a complete 360. And I was telling them, no, 360 is like in basketball. You don't want to do a 360 in life because you're going to be right back where you started from. It's a 180. It's turning back. But here's what happens, and I want us to understand today as we again grow as a church. Repentance in of itself, though, is not enough. In that you turn back, then what? So you turn back, now what? And oftentimes we've interpreted turning back as church is what we're good at. We always want to turn back the hands of time, back to a time when things were so different. We want to turn it back to a time that once was, that again, a time that wasn't always so good for everybody. Can we just turn back? But the thing about Jesus to understand today for us is that Jesus just doesn't want us to turn back to go back, but wants us to turn back to God to then also move forward to where God is calling us. Does that make sense? I heard a great preacher at this past Senate Assembly back in May over in Hunt Valley. In fact, Johanna Kinsler was there as well. Uh, This pastor named Brian McLaren. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me, I wanted to share, is he talked about how so often church is about talking about the past and what God did back then and what God did back then and what we did back then and what we taught back then. And all we're doing is trying to reinforce what happened back then. But what if we didn't see God so much as just being in our past, but God is also in our future. What if God is calling us from the future, saying, follow where I'm leading. Go where I call you to go. And isn't that the whole book of Acts as the Holy Spirit is leading the church forward into the future with new understandings and new ways of living and being as community? God who calls us forward into the future. And that's what then happens because Paul baptizes these 12 and we're told these two things, I'll touch on and be done. Two things happen after they're baptized. One, they begin to speak in tongues. Now just touch your neighbor and tell them it's going to be okay. 
I mean, I, I know our Pentecostal brothers and sisters, they really get into speaking in tongues, and then you come into a congregation like us, and oh, Lord. In fact, I remember interning at Genesis Lutheran Church in Detroit, and these young kids there told me, they said, oh, well, someone got the Holy Spirit here one time. And I was like, what? Yes, yeah, someone got the Holy Spirit here. Uh, this lady named Gunther, she got happy and started shouting and jumping around. And I just thought about that statement. Someone got the Holy... One person. One person got the Holy Spirit one time in this whole church because she began to get happy. And of course, if Lutherans get happy, we're going to... Uh, what is that feeling? <laughs> what is that? I can't make any noise. I can't, right? But I want us to also think about speaking in tongues in a new way as well. Once they're baptized, two things change that we are called to change as well. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Speak in tongues. God changed their language. God changed their linguistics. God, the Holy Spirit, should change the way we speak and the words we say. Words bring healing or words hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will what? That's a lie. That's what we lost right now in our own nation is we've sort of fallen in love with just vile talk and people that can tell it like it is. If I want people to tell it like it is, I'll go down to the bar or hang out with family, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we lost that idea of language, inspiring creativity and lifting us above who we are and how we exist and knowing how words have power and careful in what we speak. And speak words that build up and not tear down. Speak words that unite us and not push us apart. The Holy Spirit changed their language. It changed how they talk. And the Holy Spirit should change how we talk as well. To speak love and to bring healing from what we say. Then the second thing it changed to just consider today. It allowed them to prophesy. So it changed how they spoke. And it changed how they saw or what they could see. Prophecy does not mean you predict the future. That is not prophecy. That's what we often think. Prophecy is someone saying, well, better watch out because two days there's going to be a major catastrophe and this building is going to fall down. And God, that's what we think. There's elements of that in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, not Paul. For Paul, prophecy is speaking Christ into the world. It's declaring what Christ does and what Christ will do into the world and into the ears and hearts of others. Paul even talks about this in places where he speaks about how... Where are we going here? In 1 Corinthians, if I speak in the tongues of mortal angels but do not have love, I am what? A noisy gong or a clanging cymbal about how, again, prophecy, he talks about even at the bottom, and if I have prophetic powers, I understand all mysteries, all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. But prophecy, often we have thought, is like this. Remember Miss Cleo? Anybody remember Miss Cleo? Used to come on late at night, infomercials. And I don't know, you know, again, I was in college. It was late. You know, <laughs> I was having relationship problems. <laughs> I thought, maybe she knows, right? Yeah. It was just a costly phone call. Because what we found, I don't know if you ever found out, the truth was Miss Cleo, who said she was a Jamaican psychic, she was not Jamaican, and she was not a psychic. She was an actress from Los Angeles, California. And her real name was, I thought I wrote it down here, it was actually Uri Dell Harris. And she died at 53 years old. As a psychic, you would have thought she'd seen that coming, right? But 
What is the prophetic powers is not psychic. It's not being able to tell the future of all that's going to happen in that way, but it is able to declare the future, to declare God's will and what God will do in the future and what God declares for us and how we live and how we love and how we treat one. That's the prophetic powers that are given to us. And I'm reminded of this story I'll close with today about this pastor who was down in the deep south. It's told by a gentleman named Clarence Jordan. And he visited this church in North Carolina. And this is in the early 60s, at the height, of course, of Jim Crow and the civil rights movement just beginning and things happening. And so Clarence Jordan visited this church in North Carolina. And when he walked in, he could not believe what he saw. He saw a church in North Carolina during Jim Crow that was filled with people of all different colors, of all different economic classes. He saw this church with people from all these different walks of life. And he couldn't believe it in the South, in the 60s. And so when worship was over, he asked the pastor, he said, what'd you do? How did you do this? And the pastor said, do what? He said, how do you have a church that's so diverse and integrated, everyone's together and the love that's spilling. How do you do it? And the preacher said, I didn't do anything. And he said, what happened? And the preacher said, the Holy Spirit did it. And he talked about what happened, that their preacher retired. At the time, they had about 20 people. Preacher retires, and this guy was a deacon. He said, I'll preach. And his first Sunday, he didn't prepare anything. He just opened the Bible, and he stopped at the first verse he saw, and the first verse he saw said this, there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer saved or free, no longer male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. That's Paul's prophetic powers. And he said, I stopped there and I preached a sermon saying that if you don't love everybody, then you don't know Jesus. And everybody got mad, he said. But the next Sunday he got there and he said, guess what I did? And he said, what? He said, I preached the same sermon. <laughs> and after church, people were, why did you say the same sermon? Because you don't get it yet. So the next Sunday came and the preacher preached the same sermon. Well, after that, they weren't having it anymore. And the deacons pulled him aside and said, you can't preach that in here anymore. So Clarence Jordan asked the pastor, what'd you do? He said, I fired those deacons. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I preached that sermon for six months straight. How if we don't love everyone, we don't know Jesus. And he said, I preached that church from 20 people down to four people. He said, but once we got to four people and we all agreed that you've got to love everyone if you love Jesus, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit started bringing in more and more and more and more. Because again, that's that prophetic power of the Holy Spirit that looks to create a community of faith that brings healing, healing to us who are hurt, healing to us individually, and healing to us together as God's children. Again, nobody's perfect, but by the gospel, everyone is loved. And the healing power of God is in God's love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap.